So in today's webinar, we will be talking about how to improve your child's communication skills using proven ABA VB techniques. So uh, just to introduce myself, I uh, hold a bachelor's degree in speech therapy and I have been working at ARN Singapore for the past four years. And before joining ARN, I was working as a speech therapy associate in some of the special needs schools in Singapore. So having a speech therapy background, uh, the best thing I like about ABAVB approach is that it covers a lot of goals in order to improve a child's language and communication skills. So, Moving on, in today's webinar, we will be talking about what is verbal behavior in ABAVB, how ABAVB improves speech and language skills, wherein I will be talking about early language skills based on speech therapy aspects and the different categories in our ABAVB approach that falls under early language skills based on the speech therapy aspects. And finally, we will be talking about the normal speech and language development. So to start with, uh, before talking about verbal behavior, I would like to give you an introduction about ABA. ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. It is an intensive structured teaching program which simplifies complex sets of behaviors and skills into simple components. So in ABA, when we teach a child a particular skill, each skill is broken down into simple and smaller steps. So the therapist teaches each step one by one, starting from a simple skill, which could be imitation of speech sounds, moving on to a complex skill, which could be carrying on a conversation. So reinforcement is one of the main strategies used in ABA. So reinforcement simply means if something good happens at the end of the behavior, then that behavior will occur more in the future. So every good behavior or response is rewarded or reinforced. So talking about behavior, behavior is anything a person does. So it is very common for people to think of behavior in terms of negative aspects or you know, bad behavior, such as crying or throwing tantrums. However, behavior applies to positive actions also, like talking nicely, sitting nicely. So behavior involves the good as well as the bad behavior. So it is basically a behavior is anything a person does. And the goal of ABA therapy is to increase the desirable behaviors such as uh, talking nicely in sentences or uh, waiting nicely and decrease unwanted behaviors such as you know, crying, uh, hitting, screaming. Okay, now moving on to verbal behavior. The verbal behavior approach to ABA aims to demonstrate to the child the value of communication. So um, verbal behavior is based on the book Verbal Behavior by a psychologist named B.F. Skinner. So through verbal behavior, we teach functional language and communication. So instead of simply teaching the child a word, we teach them how to functionally apply or use those words in everyday situations. So it teaches why we use words, you know, the purpose of communication and how they are useful in making requests and communicating ideas. So the verbal behavior intervention works on developing communication skills, including receptive language, which is the understanding of language and expressive language, which is how we use the language. So verbal behavior may include vocal words, which means the talking, as well as for kids who cannot talk, that is like nonverbal, we use sign language, picture exchange communication system, or written language based on each kid's level. So communication is not just limited to talking. 
So it involves other forms of communication also. Moving on, let's talk about verbal operants in verbal behavior. So the psychologist B. F. Skinner classified language into different categories called verbal operants. So he uh, basically broken down the language into different types and th those are the verbal operants. So there are some technical terms used uh, here, but it is very simple and I will be explaining in detail. So over here, you can see the verbal operands. So to start with, the first one is mand, also known as requesting, which is a request for a want or a need. And then comes motor imitation, which is copying what someone else has done and then echoics or vocal imitation, which is repeating exactly what is heard. And then comes receptive, which is the following instructions to do something. So receptive is the understanding. And then tacting, which is labeling or naming objects, people, actions, events, and others. And lastly, intraverbal or conversation skills, which is the ability to respond or answer questions without any kind of visual cues. So we will be discussing about all these in detail in the coming slide. So uh, the learning within one verbal operand promotes the growth of other verbal operands. So I just wanted to give you an example. For example, um, under receptive, if we teach the child uh, follow instruction to give cookie. So when we ask cookie, the child gives cookie. So once the child learns that, we transfer that to tacting or naming. For example, when we ask what's this, the child names cookie. And then we move on to intraverbal or conversation skills. For example, when we ask, oh, what did you eat for snack? The child says cookie. So these are all connected and learning within one verbal operant promotes the growth of other verbal operants. So we will be discussing about all these in detail in the coming slides. Now, I wanted to talk about early language skills based on the speech therapy aspects. So over here, you can see a pyramid. It's the language pyramid. And the bottom part is uh, the foundation. Uh, uh, in order for a child to understand and start talking, the child should have good foundation skills. So these are called pre-verbal skills. Like over in the bottom part of the pyramid, you can see attention and listening, which are the foundation. And then comes play skills, and then understanding of uh, language, and then comes talking, and on top, we have speech sounds. Speech sounds basically uh, means, you know, how clear the child's speech is. So let's just talk about all these uh, a bit. So first and foremost, the foundation skills, also called pre-verbal skills. So it is basically communicating without using words. So it includes eye contact. So children as young as around one year old, they start to request by looking at us. So uh, most of our kids have problem with uh, eye contact. And then comes joint attention where both adult and the child focus on the same object at the same time. And then comes imitation, which is copying the actions of others and turn taking in play skills, for, for example, rolling a ball back and forth and a desire to communicate. So children as young as uh, one year old start to show a desire to communicate by either pointing or gestures. If they want to be carried, they raise their arms up or you know they would pull the adult if they want something. So all these are the pre-verbal skills, which is basically communicating without using words. So as I said before, the foundation or the pre-verbal skills is very important in order for the child to learn language. Okay, and then comes the receptive language, which is the ability to listen and understand speech. So overall understanding is the receptive language. And expressive language is how we use and combine words to share thoughts, ideas, and communicate wants and needs. So this include, you know, all the requesting, protesting, commenting, uh, asking questions, answering questions. So basically how we express or use language. 
And lastly, pragmatic language, also called social communication. So this is the social language we use in our daily interactions. So these are the early language skills based on the speech therapy aspect. So moving on, uh, so I wanted to talk about ABLES. At ARN, we use ABLES, which stands for the assessment of basic language and learning skills. Uh, it is an assessment and treatment tool in order to uh, work on a child's language skills, motor skills, uh, self-help skills, as well as academic. So ABLES uh, is developed by Dr. James Partington, who is um, one of the world's leading expert in ABAVB methodology. Uh, and I feel extremely proud to say that Dr. James Partington is our expert advisor at all uh, ARN uh, centers who guides us in the application and advancement of ABAVB methodology. So uh, moving on to the next slide, over here, I have classified ABLES categories under early language skills, which we discuss based on the speech therapy aspects. So there are some categories which are not verbal operands, but it is related to uh, the language skills uh, I discussed based on the speech therapy side. So under pre-verbal skills, we have visual performance, motor imitation. Under receptive language, there is receptive language. Expressive language, there is vocal imitation or echoic. Request, labeling, intraverbals or conversation, and syntax and grammar. And under pragmatic language, it includes social interaction. So these are the categories in, uh, covered in our ABLES program at ARN. So we will be discussing everything in detail. And also I will be sharing some activities and tips uh, under each early language skills. So moving on to the pre-verbal skills, which is the foundation. Okay, so the first one is visual performance. So visual performance doesn't come under a verbal operand. However, it is very important to teach uh, uh, the child visual performance skills or to start with because it helps to improve uh, the child's attention, uh, the child's compliance, and um, visual performance in turn will help uh, the child to learn other skills such as receptive. Receptive means you know understanding of the uh, uh, objects or uh, naming objects and moving on to the conversation. So as I said, this is the foundation. So visual performance skills in turn will help the child to achieve other important skills. So visual performance is the ability to interpret things visually and pay attention while manipulating objects. So these include puzzles, form box, and matching activities. So these are some of the basic activities I uh, put in here. So puzzles and form box or shape sorter. Over here, you can see puzzles and uh, shape sorter. So it helps to develop, as I said, it helps to improve the child's compliance, then attention, visual spatial awareness. And uh, when the child fixes a puzzle or put, in, put a shape in the shape sorter, it helps to improve fine motor skills, eye-hand coordination, and cognitive, cognitive skills. So when a therapist do a simple puzzle activity with a child, the therapist is always naming the item. For example, while fixing an animal puzzle, the therapist's uh, instruction would be cow, fix cow. Or while doing a shape sorter, the therapist's instruction would be a circle, put in circle. So the child is constantly hearing the name of the item, which in turn will help to develop cognitive skills. And then uh, problem solving skills. Uh, for example, while doing the shape sorter, initially the child might do the trial and error approach. And later on, the child will realize that, oh, I have to turn the shape sorter, look and locate the shapes and put in. So thus, it helps in problem solving skills. And then 
prepares the child for independent play. So uh, when a puzzle is shown, the child uh, learns, oh, this is how I have to play with the puzzle. And later on, interactive play, like you can take turns while doing puzzles or shape order. So it prepares the child for uh, uh, independent and interactive play skills. And then under visual performance, there is matching activities. So when we do matching, we start with object to object matching that are identical. Identical means the objects are exactly same. So uh, the child has to identify objects that are alike or same. So when we do matching, for example, if it's shoe, uh, you know, we get the child to match with the shoe, which is uh, exactly same. And another important thing is when we choose objects, we choose objects that are functional, meet, meaning uh, the objects that the child uses in everyday life, such as favorite food or clothing, okay? And it prepares the child for identifying and naming objects. So when we do matching, as I said, uh, same like uh, puzzles, so whenever we do matching, the therapist keeps naming the item. For example, while doing matching uh, of a uh, shoe, the therapist instruction would be shoe, match with shoe. Once the child matches with shoe, oh good, matching with shoe. So that, as I said, the child is hearing these words and then we can transfer these functional objects under receptive, which is identifying object and eventually naming the object. When we ask, what's this? The child names shoes. So it prepares them for the receptive as well as uh, you know, getting the child to name the object and it builds observational and scanning skills. So when we do matching, we start from array of one and move up to array of 10. So it uh, helps to improve attention, observational and scanning skills. And lastly, generalization of items. Most of our kids have problem with generalizing. So when we do matching, we start with identical object to object. And then once the kid can do that, we move on to identical pictures to picture. And then there is object to picture matching, picture to object matching, and you know, sorting non-identical items. So the kid is exposed to like, you know, the pictures and objects, uh, you know, like of the same item. So this eventually will help the child in generalization of items. So moving on, we have motor imitation. So motor imitation means copying the actions of others. So over here, we have an example. So uh, the therapist or the mom is getting the child to imitate the action, clap hands. Once the child clap hands, uh, you know, the therapist, the adult is reinforcing, oh, good job clapping hands. So imitation becomes the foundation upon which other important skills are based. So when it comes to speech therapy, I wanted to talk about language development and play skills. So um, when we get the child uh, to imitate something, the child will get the idea that when asked to do something, I'm supposed to do it, thus improving the child's compliance. And um, it in turn will help for language development. For example, uh, uh, like for in this example, clap hands, we are getting the child to imitate clap hands. So once the child can do that, we move on to receptive, which is following instruction to clap hands. When we say clap hands, sorry, show me clap hands, the child has to show clap hands. And then we move on to labeling or naming the action clap hands when we show the pictures as well as ongoing action. So it helps to improve like language development as well as play skills. In a structured play setup, the child will learn uh, to imitate actions with the toys. So, uh, you, you know, like, so the child eventually will learn to copy the actions of the adults with the toys and thus helping the child with the play skills. And these uh, imitation activities act as um, a transition uh, to imitation of speech sounds. So basically these motor imitation activities will help the child uh, 
to have an easy transition to imitation of speech sounds. So we have activities like imitation of lip and mouth movements, which I'll be discussing in the next slide. So all these will help in the transition to vocal imitation or imitation of speech sounds. Moving on, under motor imitation, some of the tasks include motor imitation using objects, so examples include, so for this also, we try to use the functional actions as far as possible. So some of the examples include drinking from cup or wiping with tissue. So over here in the picture, you can see, you know, talking over phone. And then comes gross motor imitation, which includes the larger muscles of uh, arms and legs. So uh, examples include clap hands, turn around, jump, and then comes fine motor imitation, which includes um, smaller muscles movements like fingers pointing or thumbs up. And then comes imitation of uh, lip and mouth movements. Examples include open mouth, stick out tongue, move the tongue side to side or uh, round lips or do the kissing action. So it'll be good to do, uh, especially the imitation of lip and mouth movements in front of mirror, do something like a mirror play uh, as most of the kids enjoys it that way also to make it more fun for the kids. So over here, I would like to share some activities and some tips to improve pre-verbal skills. So first and foremost, for eye contact, bring the child's favorite toys or items next to your face, that means the adult's face, when naming them or playing with them to encourage the child to look at your face. For example, if the child badly wants the child's uh, favorite toy, get the child you know, to look at you by placing uh, the favorite toy near your face and then reinforce the good looking by giving the child's favorite toy. And then you can play peekaboo games to develop eye contact. You can do interactive games like tickling. You can tickle, tickle, and then pause between, get, uh, you know, and then reinforce the good looking by tickling again blowing bubbles, swinging on the swing. You can incorporate ready, set, go uh, in activities the child enjoys. Sing nursery rhymes and include actions as well. So when we include actions as well, it helps to improve the child's joint attention, um, eye contact. And the next one is reading book. For younger kids, choose books with colorful pictures and fewer words. And then turn taking, play simple turn taking games like rolling a ball back and forth and uh, taking turns in building a tower or you know taking turns in doing puzzles. So you can play simple turn taking activities. So these are some simple activities you can do with your child to improve the pre-verbal skills, which are the foundation skills. Okay, moving on to receptive language. So receptive language, as I said before, is the understanding or following instruction to do something. So yeah, so it is the listening and understanding what others are saying. So in this example, the teacher says give apple and the child gives apple. So before the child is able to name an item, the child should be able to understand that word. The child should be able to identify the word. For example, in this apple, the child should understand the correlation between the word apple and the item apple. So some of the, some of the tasks in uh, our ABLES under receptive language includes following instructions in routine situations like uh, open door or get cookie, wash hands, and then come selecting nouns, uh, you know, the common objects. Again, as I said before, choose objects that are functional, meaning uh, the objects that the child uses every day. And then selecting action verbs like eating, drinking, playing, selects adjectives like colors, concepts like big, small, uh, clean, dirty, and uh, receptive prepositions, pronouns, and then 
selecting by a function, feature, and class. So in verbal behavior, we don't just uh, teach the child how to select an item. Uh, we uh, teaches the child to select an item by function of it, you know, the use of it. In this example, apple, the instruction would be, give me something that you eat. And the child gives apple. And feature, feature means how they look like. So the instruction would be, give me something that is red. And the child gives apple. And the next one, class, which means the category. So the instruction would be, give me something that is a fruit. And the child gives apple. So we teach children how to select items by function, feature, as well as class. Okay, now uh, here are some activities and tips for receptive language. First and foremost, obtain the child's eye contact before giving them an instruction. So this is very important. So always when you, uh, before you give an instruction, make sure the child looks at you uh, in order to get the child's attention. So the next one is name items or actions while doing everyday activities with the child. So this is important, especially uh, for our younger kids uh, who, who doesn't have much vocabulary. It's always good if you keep naming the items and actions. Start with one-step instructions. So always remember, start with one, simple one-step instructions like get apple, open door, and then move on to two-step instructions like uh, get apple and cookie or uh, open door and get back. You know, those are the two-step instructions. So always start with simple one-step instructions. Then as I said before, following instructions in routine situations like wash hands or uh, before brushing a toothbrush, get toothbrush, you know, get the child follow instructions in routine situations. And the next one is engage in play activity that the child enjoys and follow instruction in context. For example, if the child likes blowing bubbles, you know, so while playing uh, blowing bubbles with the child, get the child to follow instruction, pop bubble, you know, so the child is uh, following instruction, pop bubble in context to playing the bubble activity. And the next one is explain new concepts in different ways. So as I said before, most of our kids have problem with generalization. So when we teach concepts like big, small, clean, dirty, we have to teach them in different ways. Uh, for example, the concept wet, you know, we have to expose them like wet hair or the hands are wet or wet toy, wet shirts. So all these, uh, explanations, uh, you know, in different situations will help them uh, to improve their generalization of concept. And then you can play simple games like Simon Says and take turns in following instructions. And you can do obstacle cars. You can arrange something like a uh, jump, walk, crawl, uh, run. So uh, uh, put together an obstacle course and take turns in following instructions. And then uh, sing nursery rhymes, sing simple nursery rhymes and get the child to follow actions. You can sing songs which includes actions like if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands and get the child to follow the actions. And finally, reading books get the child to identify the items or actions based on the child's level and follow simple instructions like open book, turn page, etc. So moving on uh, to the next one, which is expressive language. So expressive language is basically how we use the language. So the first one I wanted to discuss is echoics also known as vocal imitation. So echoics means repeating exactly what others say upon request. So basically repeating exactly what is heard. So over here we have an example. The adult says, say ball, and the child says ball. So the child just repeated the word ball. 
So uh, some of our kids are able to say sounds or words spontaneously, but when asked to say those sounds or words under instruction, they have difficulty in doing so. So when teaching echoics for those kids, we have to take note uh, or make a list of the sounds or the words uh, that the child is saying spontaneously and then work on those sounds or words in our echoic trials. Okay, so some of the tasks include, on request, the child should be able to imitate sounds, repeat sound combinations like different consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant combinations, then imitate words, imitate phrases and sentences. So as I said before, um, uh, to teach echoic to nonverbal kids, observe whether the child is making any speech sound spontaneously. So always we have to watch out for uh, the spontaneous sounds the child is making and take note of those sounds. So when a child starts to make sounds spontaneously, the adult has to imitate the sound the child is making. So this results in a back and forth interaction. So what happens is, uh, when a child says a sound spontaneously, the adult imitates it and the child starts to imitate it back. So this results in a back and forth interaction and motivates the child and help them pay attention. Uh, the child would start to uh, you know, watch or look for the therapist uh, lip movements. Okay, so if the child produces the same sound after you, reinforce. After the child is consistently imitating back and forth, uh, you add and say as part of your instruction. So basically we are presenting our echoic trials now. So if the child spontaneously makes the sound ah, uh, the instruction would be say ah. Okay, so some children respond well to visual cues. So visual cues could be looking at uh, the therapist or the, uh, the adult's lip movements or tactile prompting. So tactile prompting is wherein the therapist uses the therapist fingers to provide touch cues in order to teach various sounds. So in speech therapy, there is an approach called prompt approach, wherein the therapist uses therapist fingers to provide uh, tactile cues in order to teach various sounds. So since most of our nonverbal kids uh, cannot talk, they have very limited tongue and lip movements. So they, they don't know how to move their lips or tongues much since their movements are limited. And we have to teach them how to move their lips and tongue. So at ARN, under the guidance of speech therapists, we use talk tools with some of our kids. Uh, for example, in order to say the vowel U, there should be good lip rounding. So in uh, talk tools, we do a lot of blowing strategies like blowing horns, blowing kazoo, uh, and bubbles. Uh, and also for sounds like la, ta, na, where in tongue has to go up, we have to work on those tongue movements. So uh, under the guidance of speech therapists, we use talk tools and get uh, the child, uh, you know, we get the child to work on those lip and tongue movements. Associate the learned sound with a reinforcing item or activity. So this is very important. Whatever sound the child has, we have to pair it with a reinforcing item or activity which is functional so that the child will know the purpose of communication. So among my kids who are uh, nonverbal, most of the kids start with uh, saying the vowel sounds. So if the child is able to say the vowel sound E, I immediately pair E with eat. So if the child wants a, a favorite cookie, the child has to say E and then the child gets it. Same like vowel O, uh, I pair it with open. If the child wants to go out, get the child to say O for open. So even if it's just a single sound, it is important to associate or pair the sound with uh, a reinforcing item or activity. 
uh, you can also do, you know, fill in songs with these sounds, like uh, songs like Old MacDonald or Bingo Song. So wherein you, you just have to get the child to fill in those sounds because the song will help uh, in kind of, you know, uh, remembering those sounds. Once the child can consistently produce individual sound, combine the learned sound in different combinations, such as consonant, vowel. Uh, for example, if the child is able to say the consonant m mm and vowel a, ah, we can work on the combination ma. So initially, therapists might have to use the therapist uh, fingers to provide tactile or touch cues to say mm, ah, ma. So eventually, fade away the, uh, the hand prompts and then the child, uh, once the child is able to say ma, we combine it with ma, ma, and then we can associate with mom's picture and also vowel, vowel combination. For example, uh, you know, if the child is able to say the vowels u and a, ah, if we put together, it'll be wa. So we can pair wa with water. So if the child wants water, you know, get the child say wa and uh, give water and consonant vowel, consonant combinations also. So uh, it is very important to pair uh, whatever sound the child has with an item or activity that is functional. So moving on to the next one, which is mand, also known as requesting. So a mand is a request for a want or a need. Okay, so requesting is the basic skill wherein a child learns how to talk spontaneously. So we have uh, kids who are able to name objects when asked. However, they won't be using those words while talking spontaneously. So through manding, children learn that they can get what they want by asking. So manding provides children an alternative to problem behaviors. So since they don't know how to request, it ends up in uh, unwanted behaviors like crying or throwing tantrums. So it is very important to teach the child uh, to communicate for, especially for the things the child badly wants. And then the item or activity should be motivating. So we have to find uh, what, uh, item or activity motivates for that child so that the child will be motivated to ask for it. So when teaching requesting, we place the motivating item out of reach from the child to elicit com the communication. So basically the motivator would be controlled by adult. So over here we have an example. So there is a mom and uh, a boy and the boy's favorite snack is cookie which is in a container which the child cannot open so uh, imagine the child badly wants cookie and um, uh, just imagine this boy is not saying any words spontaneously so if the child wants cookie get the child say cookie so once the child says cookie uh, you give a small piece of cookie. So initially, mom has to model uh, to say cookie. So once the child says cookie, uh, she reinforced with a small piece of cookie. So the reason why I'm saying small piece is in one activity itself, there will be so many opportunities for the child to request. You know, we can practice a lot in one activity itself. So once the child is able to say cookie upon request, uh, we can start giving indirect verbal prompts. As you can see in this example, the indirect verbal prompt is, you know, the mom is asking, what do you want? And the child says cookie. So that question, what do you want, is an indirect verbal prompt. And then if the child can do that, our next goal is the child should be able to say cookie spontaneously or independently the moment the child sees cookie, you know, like with the presence of the motivator, the child says cookie spontaneously without any prompts. And our final goal is, uh, you know, even without the presence of the motivator, when the child feels like eating cookie, the child would go near mom uh, and 
independently says cookie. So that is our ultimate goal. So it all goes step by step. Model the language you want the child to use. Uh, so over here, how to model. So uh, some kids can imitate uh, one word, but there are kids who cannot uh, correctly imitate one word. Uh, you know, for those kids, maybe we have to start with word approximation. There, there are kids who can only say the initial sound of the word. Uh, for example, for bubble, if the child just says ba, I'll reinforce with bubble. You know, at least the child is putting in the effort. So for those kids who cannot say uh, one word, we'll have to start with word approximation. And then comes one word. And if the child is using single words, we can model two word phrases. And if the child is talking at two word level, we can model three word sentences. And if the child is talking at three word level, we can model four word sentences. So over here, we have an example in, the, in our above example cookie. So at first, maybe the child would just say cook, you know, so, and then we can reinforce that. And, get, and then our goal would be getting the child to say cookie. And then, you know, I want cookie. Once a child can say that, we add one more word, making it I want eat cookie. So once a child is able to say in four sentence, we can introduce the question form, which is can I eat cookie? Okay, now, if the child is not talking, we have to model with uh, either signs or pictures to request depending on each kid. So over here, this is the sign for eat. And now sequence for requesting. So this is a sequence for requesting. We start with uh, the child's favorite objects, which could be, you know, uh, food or toys, then activities, for example, tickles, then action, which could be open, then attention, if the child is talking, get the child to call that person, you know, by calling mama, for example. Or if the child is not talking, uh, just tapping the uh, adult. And then missing items, wherein we have to purposely create the opportunity for the child to request. Uh, so uh, if there is uh, uh, an activity of like coloring activity, uh, you know, we purposely don't give uh, the crayon so that uh, the child badly wants to col uh, color, uh, you know, but the crayon is not there. So the child has to come and ask, oh, where is crayons? So child asking for crayons to color. And lastly, information, which basically includes the WH questions like, uh, where is the ball? What is this? So uh, just to summarize, the items to use for requesting should be strongly motivating. Uh, it can be uh, delivered quickly, allows only a brief period of contact. It can be adult control, and the sign or word used for requesting should not be too hard for the child to produce. So moving on to the next one, it is labeling, also known as tacting. So it is naming objects, actions, people, events, and others. So over here, we have an example. So uh, the mom is asking the child, what's this? And the child names bubble. So this is an example of uh, naming or tacting. Uh, so um, uh, the, through this labeling activities, it helps to increase the child's vocabulary uh, so that eventually the child can talk in sentence level. So in order for the child to talk at sentence level, the child should have a good vocabulary. So the labeling activities will help to improve the child's vocabulary. So some of the tasks include labeling nouns. We start with common objects. As I always say, start with objects that are functional, meaning the objects that the child uses or sees every day. So once the child has a good set of nouns, we move on to um, action verbs. Uh, like sleeping, playing, eating. We do both pictures as well as ongoing actions to work on you know, the generalization. 
and then labels, adjectives. So as I said, you know, the examples before, like uh, colors, shapes, the different concepts like big, small, long, short, uh, clean, dirty, and labels emotions like happy, sad, labels prepositions like on, under, in front of, pronouns like um, I, you, he, she. So it is important to work on uh, all these uh, 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 vocabulary so that you know we can get the child to talk at sentence level. So once the child is able to say single words, we move on to two word combinations. So examples include noun plus noun, which is the object plus object, something like uh, cookie and ball, and then verb plus object, which could be you know reading book. So reading is the verb and object uh, is the book. And adjective plus noun, like uh, blue ball. So blue is the adjective and ball is the noun and preposition plus object like uh, on the table or under the table. So once a child is good in using two word combinations, we can work on three word combinations like subject plus verb plus object. An example would be uh, mama eating cookie. So that's, that's mama is subject, eating is the verb and cookie is the object. And then we have activities like labeling using carrier phrase. So with the carrier phrases also, we have to go step by step. So there are like different carrier phrases like this is, it's a, uh, that is, so I see. Uh, so uh, I would like to give you an example. So exam uh, one example would be with the carrier phrase, this is. So initially we might be teaching the child to say, uh, this is a ball. Okay, once the child can say that, we introduce one more word like this is a blue ball. So just make sure the child already knows the adjective blue. So we are basically expanding the child's sentence length. Another example would be, you know, initially we get the child to say with the carrier phrase, I see a girl. Once a child is able to say that, I see a girl eating. And then, you know, I see a girl eating cookie. So we are basically increasing the child's sentence length by adding one more word to what the child is saying. And then lastly, labels by function, feature, and class. So as I said uh, earlier in receptive, uh, in uh, verbal behavior, we get the child to label items by function of it, which is, you know, uh, the use. So, uh, and then feature, how they look like, and class, which is the category. Uh, okay, over here, I would like to uh, tell you about um, a technique or strategy we use in speech therapy. So it's called expansion technique which is basically to increase the child's utterance length or sentence length. So as the name suggests, we are basically expanding or increasing the child's sentence length. So expand the child's utterance by adding one or two words to what the child is saying. So I have discussed this model before in the slide, you know, model one word if the child is not talking, two words if the child is using single words, three words if the child is combining two words already, and then model four word sentences if the child can say three word sentence. And now, if the child has difficulty imitating phrases or sentences, you, we can use uh, two ways of visual prompts depending on the child. So the first one would be sign language. Okay, so for example, for the sentence, I want eat. If the child has a difficulty, we can use a sign language, I want eat. So the sign language will be kind of like a visual prompt for the child to imitate uh, the sentence. And uh, also you can use visual approach using pictures. You can either take printouts or drawings or you can uh, for, people's uh, picture, you can even get the real pe uh, people's pictures. So for example, if there is a sentence like mama eating cookie, get the child uh, to point at the picture of mama, point at the picture of eating and then cookie. So that the pictures will be kind of like a visual prompt for the child uh, to say, uh, to imitate the sentences. And also you can use written words if the child is able to read 
um, some of our kids are good in reading. So those uh, words would be like a visual prompt to talk in sentences. So where and when to use expansion strategy? So there are many opportunities throughout the day. Over here, we have some examples. In routine activities, if the child says noodles, the adult expanded by adding one more word to it, which is hot noodles. In reading book, the child says eating cake and adult expanded boy eating cake. Same like in playing bubble also, when the child said blow bubble, adult said mama blow bubble. So basically we're just expanding the child's sentence by adding one more word to it. And then comes um, uh, the last one under verbal operants, which is intraverbals, also known as the conversation skills. So intraverbal is giving a response based on something someone else has said. So this involves responding or answering questions without any visual cues present. So there is no object, there is no pictures. So it's mostly, you know, a conversation. So over here, we have an example. Uh, so when mom asks, oh, what did you eat for lunch? The child says rice and chicken. So this addresses more advanced conversation skills uh, and abstract language. So some of the tasks in intraverbals include fill in words. It could be uh, fill in words from songs or fill in um, you know, the uh, routine activities, something like it's time to wash and then the child has to fill in hands. And uh, then uh, answering questions regarding personal information like name, age, address, answering yes or no questions, WH questions, describing items, tell about stories or experiences. So this is a bit more advanced level. So mostly at the conversation level. And lastly, I would like to talk about syntax and grammar. So this also doesn't come under verbal operand, but uh, I'm talking this based on the speech therapy aspects. So this is also uh, included in our ABLES. So uh, syntax, and grammar, this applies for kids who are already talking at sentence level, but makes grammar mistakes or their sentence structure would be incorrect. So syntax refers to the rules of word order and word combinations in order to form phrases and sentences. So this basically means uh, the sentence structure. And grammar refers to using the correct word forms in sentences. So over here, we have an example. The, child, the boy is eating noodles and the girl is commenting. He is eating spicy noodles. So the girl is using a pronoun, which is he, and she's talking at four to five word sentence length and her uh, sentence structure is correct. So, so some of the tasks under syntax and grammar include mean length of utterance to see, you know, uh, how many word sentence the child is talking. Is the child talking at a two word sentence, three word sentence, or four to five word sentence? And word order, basically, uh, you know, this uh, sentence structure, whether the child is using the correct word order while talking. And then comes the grammar part like articles, for example, uh, examples of articles include a and the plurals, tenses like past, present, future tense, pronouns like I, you, he, she, conjunctions like um, and, but, because. So using these conjunctions, the child uh, you know, can talk in really longer sentences when the child learns to talk using conjunctions. So uh, yeah, so these are uh, the tasks under um, expressive language. So over here, I would like to share some activities and tips in order to improve uh, the child's expressive language. So first and foremost, talk about what the adult or the child is doing. So this is very important. Uh, especially for parents when uh, you are the one who spend most of the time with the child at home. So it's important to talk whatever you or the child is doing. And when you talk, uh, remember to talk in simple sentences so that the child will understand the meaning of it. 
And the next step is offer choices. Offer choices if the child isn't responding to open-ended questions like WH questions. So especially for our young kids, uh, instead of asking, uh, what do you want to eat? Just offer them choice. Do you want to eat apple or cookie? So it'll be good if there is a, a model, a visual model also. So, you know, it's easy for the kid to choose between the two when we ask, oh, do you want apple or cookie? And for kids who cannot talk yet, they can even point to what they want. And uh, it's important to be face to face when talking to the child, stay at their eye level. And uh, next step is commenting instead of asking questions, especially uh, with our younger kids. When we ask them a lot of questions, they might not know how to answer those questions. So instead of asking questions, we have to comment a lot. So an example could be instead of asking, do you want to put on shoes? You can just comment, put on shoes. So uh, comment a lot and uh, reduce the number of questions, especially for younger kids. So the next step is model the word or sentence or sign for the child if he or she doesn't know what to say. Okay, and the next one is play activities. Engage in play activities that the child likes and model words and phrases when, uh, while playing with a child. And the next step is wait or pause in between to give your child an opportunity to talk. So sometimes we just have to wait and see maybe between five and 10 seconds uh, to see whether the child would respond instead of immediately prompting or modeling what to say. So sometimes we just have to use a wait and see approach. And the next step is get the child to fill in ongoing activities. So initially we, we might have to start with getting the child to fill in last word of the phrase. For example, it's time to wash the child fills in hands. So once the child can do that, get the child to fill in the last two words of the phrase. So according to the context, uh, example would be it's time to, and then the child fills in wash hands, okay? And then there is sing nursery rhymes, sing simple nursery rhymes and pause and get the child to fill in words from the song. And lastly, reading books, get the child to name the items or answer questions based on the child's level. So uh, yeah, so that is, uh, you know, the end of expressive language. Moving on to pragmatic language. So as I said before, pragmatic language is social communication. So under ABLES, we have social interactions. So social interaction refers to the way in which children use language within social situations, okay? So these include ability to use language for different purposes. So when we talk, we use language for various purposes. It could be greetings, requesting, asking questions, commenting, answering questions. And then it includes the ability to adapt language to meet the needs of listener or the situation. An example could be talking louder when there is lots of noise. So the child knows, oh, in this situation, you know, I have to talk louder. And the last one is following the often unspoken rules of conversation, like taking turns in conversation, uh, looking at the speaker while talking, uh, using facial expressions. So, uh, so yeah, so over here you can see an example. So the two children greeting each other by saying hi. So some of the tasks under social interaction include choose in the behavior of others, looks at others to start a social interaction, imitates peers, greetings. Um, it could be initiating greeting and returning greeting, converse with others, and lastly, sharing. Uh, you know, if the, children, uh, if, um, the child is playing uh, with other kids, whether the child shares the toy, or if the child wants something to be shared, but the child goes and asks, you know, can I have that? So it involves both, you know, sharing as well as asking for the item that the child wants. So we have over here some activities uh, 
uh, to encourage social interaction. First and foremost, greetings. Encourage the child to say hello and bye in social interactions. Second one is role play. Engage in role play activities with uh, adults and other children to simulate social situation. Example could be, you know, going uh, for shopping. So uh, you, you can uh, you can do a role play for that. You know, make a shopping list. Uh, this person will be the cash cashier. Uh, so this person has to, you know, buy things. Uh, uh, from the shopping list and then uh, give money to the cashier. So the child will, un uh, through this role play, the child will understand, uh, you know, how to talk and interact uh, according to this social context. So the next one is visuals. Use visual charts that list out various rules and cues necessary for a targeted situation. An example could be during circle time, so you can use a visual chart. It could be either pictures or if the child can read, you can write it down. So during circle time, it could be something could, uh, some example, for example, it could be something like, you know, sit nicely or hands quiet or raise your hand if you want to talk to teacher. So you can use visual charts to list out the rules uh, according to, you know, uh, which are targeted for a specific situation. Then uh, we can play turn-taking games, engage in turn-taking games such as board games to teach the child that it's okay to lose and follows the rules of the game and engage in an activity for a longer period of time. And then comes sharing. As I said before, you know, uh, gives up items to be shared or ask for items to be shared during snack time or play activities. And then um, a great way to teach is social stories. Develop social stories that depict how to behave and respond in certain social situations. So we can create uh, social stories um, according to what we want uh, the child to be worked on. And then comes social skills group. Work with the school or social class group to set up small structured uh, group where social skills can be practiced, such as turn taking skills, waiting, responding, staying on topic, you know, where we can practice all these. And lastly, describing activities. So this is uh, this activity is for kids who has difficulty uh, to sticking to the topic of conversation. You know, they have problem in topic maintenance. So for such kids, we can do uh, describing activities wherein you know look at the pictures together to encourage descriptive language about a topic or a thing with the adult prompting to keep the child on topic. So uh, with that picture, we'll be like taking turns uh, to talk about that uh, uh, topic, you know, uh, like describing about it so that the child will stick on to that topic of conversation. Okay, now coming to the last part, which is the normal speech and language development. So let's quickly go through this. Uh, okay, before the child is one year old, the child's speech is mostly in the form of either crying and then the child starts to babble. So firstly, the babbling would be with the same sounds like ma, ma, ma or uh, da, 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 you know, and then uh, when the child babbles, the child includes different consonants like ma, da, you know, like various consonants and vowels. And by the time the child is one year, the uh, child uh, usually uses gestures such as pointing or wave goodbye and uh, say simple words such as mama or dada. And then by the time the child is 18 months, the child understands uh, simple words, says approximately 60 to 20 words depending on the child and uh, follows simple one step instructions like throw the ball and uh, speech is 25% intelligible to strangers. So what uh, intelligible means how much the speech is understood by uh, strangers. So an 18 months old would be understood only by 
uh, you know, the parents, the outsiders have difficulty to understand. So that is perfectly normal. So the speech might be just 25% intelligible to strangers. And by the time the child is two years, the child starts to produce two word combinations, says approximately 50 words or more, understand simple WH questions, you know, just maybe just what and where questions and follow simple two-step instructions like get ball and cookie. And now the speech becomes 50% intelligible to strangers. And by the time the child is three years, the child speaks uh, in sentence length of three to five words and follows complex two-part instructions, something like open the fridge and get milk. Then understand simple WH questions like what, where, who, ask simple questions like what, where, who, and now the speech becomes 75% intelligible to strangers. And by the time the child is four years, the child uses conjunctions such as and, but, because to make longer sentences, understand most of the WH questions like what, where, who, when, why, asks a lot of questions, uses pronouns and negations, and now the speech is 100% intelligible to strangers. Um, it's normal for a four-year-old uh, to have one or two speech sounds which this child cannot produce. However, the overall speech should be understood by strangers. And by the time the child is five years, the child should be able to follow three-step instructions, use well-formed sentences, uh, take turns in conversations, tell simple stories with proper beginning, uh, middle part, and end part, and they start to use grammar part also correctly, like using past and future tense correctly. So over here, we can, uh, yeah, we have come to the last uh, uh, slide under our webinar, so let's watch this video. Well, children will always learn new words. But what if they don't know how to use them? A child with language delays might know how to use the word toilet when they see one. However, they might not be able to use the word toilet when they need one or correctly answer what a toilet is used for. Verbal behavior is a teaching method that teaches a word's meaning by showing how to apply it functionally. It is often combined with applied behavior analysis, a practice used to treat social and communication delays faced by those on the autism spectrum. The result is known as ABAVB, a therapy methodology that demonstrates the value of communication words motivating children to engage in speech. Our ABAVB programs involve multiple speech-based activities that build your child's vocabulary, like nouns, verbs, adjectives, and prepositions, to name a few. Receptive skills, or listener responding, helps kids respond to spoken words. Students learn to follow instructions like identifying specified objects or actions like go to mommy or get pencil. Labeling allows students to name the items that they see, hear, smell, or even taste and make comments about it. For example, this is a car or this is sweet. We teach students to request for items and toys and comment on the surrounding environment. We encourage our students to ask and answer questions, as well as asking for help or clarifying instructions from their therapists. We also help them practice the application of the five W's and one H, and we also facilitate group activities like turn-taking conversations. For kids that have learned to start using their language, we work on increasing the length of their utterance and practicing for proper speech. For nonverbal kids, we teach them signs or sign language as a form of communication. The therapist teaches them the sign for an item or activity while simultaneously saying the word. Eat. Mm. Yes, what do you want? Mm. Good job. Communication is an important and constant part of our lives. Every child deserves to know how to communicate, whether with family or friends, and especially in school. At ARN, your child will be encouraged to communicate their wants and needs. Yeah, uh, so this video summarizes what all we discussed today to increase the child's, uh, to improve the child's communication. In school. Uh, so moving on to question and answer session. 
So uh, I have got some questions here. Um, okay, over here, uh, there is one question. Will teaching sign language to my child help to improve his speech? Uh, yes, uh, definitely the sign language uh, will help to improve a child's speech, uh, especially for those children who are either nonverbal or uh, has difficulty saying sounds or words under instruction. Uh, so through sign language, uh, children can communicate uh, their wants and needs. Uh, what happens is since the child cannot communicate, that's when it results in all, uh, you know, the problem behaviors like crying for, uh, if they want something or throwing tantrums. So when we use sign language, we are saying the word at the same time that we are signing. So this is very important. So whoever use sign language, always uh, say the word at the same time you are signing so that uh, the child will understand the connection between the word uh, and the sign. So uh, when we start teaching a child sign language, uh, we usually start with basic requests. Uh, such as signing for eat or toilet, which is functional. Uh, so does uh, sign language will help to improve a child's receptive skill, uh, meaning, uh, you know, understanding of the word and the expressive skill, meaning the child is able to use it in the form of signs, thus helping the child to increase the vocabulary. So sign language will help the child to increase the vocabulary and um, eventually like in my experience i have seen kids who might be signing at first and eventually you know they start uh, to talk also and also for kids who has difficulty in imitating um uh, sentences as i have said in the previous slide the sign language will be kind of like a visual prompt for them to imitate the sentences so sign language will definitely uh, improve uh, a child's speech. Okay, so I hope I answered that question. So over here, I have another question. Uh, want to know more about unclear speech. Okay, so unclear speech is basically when a child cannot correctly produce a speech sound. So when a child has uh, a difficulty in correctly producing a speech sound beyond an expected age, that is when we say the child has unclear speech or articulation disorder. So first and foremost, what I have to say is, uh, you know, the parents should know the speech sound development chart. So you can go to Google and get that chart uh, from Google. So you just have to type speech sound development chart. So in that chart, you can uh, get the child's age and the list of the sounds which the child should be developmentally able to say according to the child's age. Uh, for example, a two-year-old should be able to say very easy uh, sounds. We call it like easy sounds, like uh, you know the sounds such as p, b, m, w, h. So these are the easy developing sounds. So if you have a three-year-old child, and uh, you know if that three-year-old child has difficulty in uh, saying these easy developing sounds, then that is considered as an problem, you know, that would be considered as an articulation disorder. However, if your child is only three year old, and if the child cannot say uh, difficult sounds like sh or j, which comes later on, like at around five year old, then, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. So that's why I said it is important to know the speed sound development chart and uh, take note of uh, the age and the list of the sounds which the child should be uh, developmentally able to say according to the age. And uh, usually the speech therapist start articulation therapy at around, you know, the child turns three year old. And 
it's also important to work on other aspects of language like uh, you know uh, preverbal skills or receptive language or expressive language get the child to talk in sentences also if the child has uh, difficulty or difficulty or delay in all those areas as well so when you go to a speech therapist the first thing they do is you know they would take a formal or informal articulation assessment and uh, they will get Uh, they uh, an idea about the list of the sounds which the child has difficulty producing so when we do articulation therapy we usually start at isolation so again we have to start from easy developing sounds according to the chart so if a child cannot say a sound in one of those easy developing sound list we have to start with those sounds first so we usually start in isolation isolation means just the sound for example uh, one of the easily uh, developing sound is the sound b okay so in isolation would be just getting the child to say b okay so once the child can correctly say that in isolation we move on to syllable level syllable level would be by adding a vowel to that consonant b uh, consonant b so which would be you know b b b b so that is the syllable level so once the child can say at syllable level we move on to word level so in word level we get the child to say the word with that target sound in the initial position of the word final position of the word as well as the middle position of the word so for example in the sound b uh, an example of the word with uh, initial uh, with b in the initial position would be uh, bus bat okay or the final position would be tub tap cup and the middle position would be something like table or bubble okay so once the child can say at word level we move on to phrase level uh, something like my ball or blue ball so you know the the sound b is there so we try with different phrases and if the child can say that we move on to uh, the sentence level and then to the conversation level so conversation level it it, ha- it would be like a structured conversation first and then we practice those in the real conversation so the articulation or you know the, while working for the kids who have unclear speech we follow the sequence so yeah so these are just a summary about unclear speech so i hope i answered your question okay then uh there is another question uh how to encourage the child to communicate non verbally uh okay so uh, how to encourage the child to communicate non verbally so from this question i'm assuming uh the child is non verbal uh, because if the child can talk get the child to talk okay so for kids who are non verbal in my experience the best thing that work is sign language so in speech therapy we call it aac alternative and augmentative mode of communication which is you know a mode of communication other than speech so sign language is a great way to teach uh, kids who are non verbal uh, it is um, it is easy for the kids to learn and even if the child has difficulty imitating a sign we just have to like physically prompt the a uh, child to uh, imitate the sign so i in my experience i usually uh, start with sign language for most of my kids who are non verbal however there are other forms of communication also like text you know picture exchange communication system but for that uh, the child's picture discrimination ability should be good okay so there is like picture uh, text picture exchange communication system and recently there are so many apps also so uh, in my previous workplace there was a kid who is really uh, good in using a, a, an app called prolog to go uh, so this is an app uh, like even an apple ipad and all you can get this app it's called prolog to go so the child used to communicate really well using that app so choosing Uh, the uh, non-verbal mode of communication. Also, it depends on 
each child, you know, uh, this would work for, uh, uh, text would work for one kid or this a communication app, to allow to go would work for one kid, but might not for another. So you have to take note of the kid's strength and limitation, but to start with, with most of my kids who are nonverbal, I use sign language. Okay, so I hope I answered that question. Um, let's, uh, okay, there is uh, one more question, which is why my son still can't speak? Okay, so why my son still cannot speak? This is a very generic question. I don't know uh, more details about the child, but you know, there could be an, there would be an underlying condition why your child cannot talk. And usually there are multiple reasons why a child cannot talk. So it'll be a hard for me to say, you know, why uh, the child can't speak yet, uh, but it'll be good uh, to get an assessment done. Uh, you know, consult a professional, a pediatrician, or a speech therapist to see, you know, what exactly is a child's problem, as there are, like, multiple reasons for a child not being able to talk. Okay, I hope I answered that question. Okay, so uh, I think we have almost come to the end of this webinar. Thank you for asking all these interesting questions. So if you have more uh, concerns, queries, uh, or if you want to know about more about us, please feel free to contact us. Our office address is uh, displayed here, the contact details, and uh, you, know, you can contact us through email, Facebook, as well as uh, Instagram. So I hope uh, my webinar was helpful for all of you. Uh, once again, thank you for asking uh, interesting questions. Uh, thank you for joining me. Hope to see you in uh, the, hope to see you next time in the coming webinars. Okay, bye.